Welcome to Chief Evangelist. I'm your host, Ethan Butte. I'm on a mission to explore and understand the role of the Chief Evangelist and the movement behind it. How should CEOs be thinking about it? How does it benefit the company? Which companies and markets need evangelism most? What does the work involve? What does success look like? And who's a good fit as a Chief Evangelist? That's what we're exploring at chiefevangelist.com and in conversations like this one. Today, we're learning from the head of community and chief evangelist at True Footage. He joined the company just over a year ago, and what a year it's been. From five or 10 employees to nearly 500, becoming one of the largest appraisal companies in America. So you'll get insights into industry innovation and community-focused evangelism in a high-growth environment. Blaine Fyan, welcome to Chief Evangelist. Thank you, Ethan. It's really an honor to be here. Super excited. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, of course. Really, I, I always enjoy conversations with you. I think we've only spent time in person together once, uh, but I always enjoy our time together. And I'm excited to have this focused conversation because we haven't had this conversation before together. And so uh, opening questions, standard for everybody, and it's been fun to see where they go. Uh, as you reflect, what would you say is the most important job of a chief evangelist? Yeah, uh, great question. And and I think I, I have to say, I want to make sure I say to the audience that uh, I feel like I'm speaking to my teacher and my mentor here because, uh, you, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about origin stories, but, you know, you, you were the catalyst uh, and the impetus for the the title. And, you know, I, I lean on you for, for input on this. Um, and I want to make a distinction between job and function, and I'm sure you will as well. To me, I think the most important job of the, the, the chief evangelist is to believe. Uh, I think it is to, to have um, an unwavering, unquestioning belief. Uh, belief in, you know, solving problems, so, you know, clarity around that belief. And then of course, some energy and inspiration. Love it. And then go to the other side of it because you drew the distinction. Uh, well, the functions, yeah, the, the distinction between job and functions, of course, the functions are vast. I mean, uh, you, you've interviewed some, some heavy hitters in, in Jen Allen, Jim Kalbach, and uh, you know, you've, you've interviewed Guy Kawasaki and, you know, I've followed all of that. Um, so I'm learning from them, and, and and as we've learned from all of them, and they're awesome insight, uh, the functions are vast. I, I don't think anybody can be pigeonholed. Um, you would know this better than anybody, that the the inside-out stuff, outside-in, and just what we can get kind of pulled into, um, as well as the directions we see might benefit from some evangelism, uh, they they kind of expose themselves, the opportunities arise all the time. Love it. So uh, this belief thing is really interesting. You know, one of the, I host another podcast, the customer experience podcast, and we often talk about like human versus tech, you know, what, you know, and generally everyone lands with the idea that tech is meant to put humans in their best position. Um, that's to say to do what humans do best. And I, when I hear the word belief, and especially the way you kind of followed on to it, I feel like that's such a distinctly human thing. I don't know that a bot can believe or express belief, or express belief in a way to inspire confidence in others. Um, share anything else you want about this idea of belief, like, um, may, and maybe even from the human angle. Like, how do you think about belief? Why is it so important? And then um, maybe it's transferability to other people. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, you know, I think it comes down to to trust, to authenticity, to that whole. I mean, everything you've written books about, which I love, and I, I use as manuals for life. Uh, and, and interacting with other human beings, that that human connection, human centeredness, but everything we're doing comes down to trust and authenticity, which is something I don't think of the the bot, the computer, the AI, none of that can be recreated. Uh, and as you you wrote so well about in in the first book, Rehumanized, uh, you know we're wired uh, to our core. We are wired to to interact in a certain way with other human beings, and we look for those cues and clues. And we 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 read all the subtle feedback, uh, and humans are um, infinitely good at sniffing out inauthentic behavior, and they are making decisions fairly quickly about trust. Um, and so I think that that belief piece is kind of the fuel that um, that that fires uh, and and sends the message to other human beings that this person really believes in what they're saying, and trust is kind of a natural bridge that they can walk across with that belief. 
Love it. Really, really well said. And you triggered a big idea for me that uh, I don't think I'll take us down that road of just now that I'm going to spend some time thinking about, but it really is about how much, again, just borrowing from the second book, Human-Centered Communication, the the idea of all the noise and pollution in the environment and what are we supposed to believe anymore and this idea that there's a human being in front of us on the screen or uh, you know on a live call or in my LinkedIn feed or in my Instagram feed or or on a stage or whatever that seems to have good, pure intent and some excitement around it is like, it's something that I feel like we need right now. I, you mentioned origin story. I want to go there now, mostly because uh, I think your your concept of belief leads me to a question that's going to walk us into it. So um, I guess get to origin story on, because I know you have a deep background in appraisal. Um, that's kind of at the core function of uh, what True Footage is doing. Mm-hmm. And um, I'd like for you to start going down that road off the idea of belief. What do you believe? that's related to what true footage is doing that makes you the right person to kind of lead this charge? Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Um, I'm actually going to leave the appraisal side of the origin story and go back even deeper, which is um, the martial arts side of things. Okay. I grew up doing martial arts. My father's a multiple black belt in judo. And so we just grew up, you know, in the dojo, so to speak. And um, at when I was 18, 19, I found a martial art called Aikido. Uh, and which is all about kind of blending and using the other person's energy in circles and resolution of conflict, conflict management, and that kind of thing, um, which of course extends itself and lends itself to the business world, human communication, uh, resolving conflicts in our lives. It's it's not all about fighting. Uh, and I got deep into it. I moved to Chicago. I lived inside of the dojo for many years. I traveled around with what I consider to be the greatest evangelist for the martial art of Aikido that one could ever meet. I mean, he's world, he was world renowned. He's since passed away. Um, And of course he didn't use that language. I didn't know that language. Uh, Not even sure back in the nineties, that, that term or the title was around in the business world. Um, But I drew from that because it was, I was living inside the dojo in a very specific um, Eastern style program, mentorship program. Uh, There were four of us at a time that lived in the dojo. and, And our job was just to study the, the, uh, chief instructor and learn leadership, learn how he communicated with people, uh, travel around, carry his bags, servant leadership type stuff. And it was a profound, profound experience um, doing that kind of thing that once I got into the business world, um, I realized there was something inside of me. It was a seed that had been planted inside of me and it was this servant leadership type thing. And I also had realized through all the different things that I had done, real estate sales, uh, loan originator, uh, heating, cooling, mechanical contracting, all these things I tried, that where there was not a really strong belief around the thing, um, I had a difficult time uh, kind of selling to others. It became very mechanical. Uh, We're just doing the job. What's the end goal? Okay, we we head toward that end goal. Um, And so I realized I, I am put on this earth and I am kind of wired around When I believe in something and the belief is deeply tied to helping other human beings grow and develop and evolve. Because my instructor at the time sat us all down, all of the the live-in students, which there were only four at the time. And these are the people that he's building up to be future Aikido instructors. Uh, and, And he said something very profound. He said, my job is to make you better than I am. My job, the, the greatest gift you can give your sensei is to, to exceed me, to be better than I am someday, and then help others be better than you. And so it removed that ego piece. And my mind was blown, and it's been ringing in my ears for 30 plus years now. Um, and so I realized also then from that point forward, I get the most immense joy and self-satisfaction from helping others grow. And I think that's tied to that belief. I have to believe in what I'm doing not what I'm selling. And so the the belief piece, I think, uh, for, for all, I think chief evangelists, if you don't really believe strongly that the thing you're doing or selling is helping humanity in some way, you're really just maybe a good salesperson. Uh, and that's kind of the distinction that I have in my head is I don't want to just be, I, I don't like sales. I'm not in sales. Uh, you know, when we talk about evangelize the problem, not the product, which I love. Um, for me, the problem is is human evolution and growth and development. 
Love it. Uh, gosh, so much there. And I, I appreciate going all the way back there. And what a wonderful story and that light bulb moment for you 30 years ago. Yeah. And it's it's funny. I mean, I just even reflecting on what you shared there and like, how real is that for me personally? And I'm much slower and later to that game than you are. Um, and I, I really appreciate the way you express that. Um, take us into, um, so you said you've tried a number of things. There's a, I'm very familiar with all of those industries because at BombBomb, Bomb we serve into all of them, a couple of them in, 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 with a great deal of depth. Um, walk us into uh, your earliest conversations with uh, whoever you were talking with at True Footage as, because it's a relatively young company. Yeah. Um, what was going on for them? Uh, what was going on for you? How did you make the connection? Uh, and what was the original vision for your involvement there? And then maybe let's bridge into your belief about what true, true footage is doing. Sure. Or yeah. what you're doing in the context of true footage, I guess. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, so to, to go from the martial arts stuff to my, my next life, of course, around uh, appraising, been in the appraisal world for 20 plus years, real estate before that, mortgage before that. And uh, I started a coaching company. So I realized again, this evangelism thing and helping other humans grow and develop and evolve. Um, I had built several successful businesses or what I considered successful anyway, in those terms of helping others and um, being recognized in the market as the authority because we cared more about the people than the product. Mm -hmm. And so I realized I could help others. Um, and, and it wasn't a paid coaching program. People just kind of came to me and said, hey, can you help me do what you've done? And so I, I realized I'd been coaching people or I, I could coach people in that regard. And then a couple of years into doing that for free, uh, I decided sometimes having people pay for things, they get more out of it because they're more committed. So I started a paid coaching program. So I've been coaching um, both realtors and, and appraisers primarily for about 10 plus years now. Um, and I realized the 20 prior years of teaching Aikido, I built a very large uh, martial arts school with live-in students kind of in the vein of of what I experienced in Chicago, um, I had realized I'd been coaching people on, on the Aikido mat and in personal conversations now for 20 years. So 10,000 at bats of dealing with human problems and helping people evolve and grow, essentially getting results. Um, so from the coaching, uh, many of several of my coaching students that we had helped grow their business quite significantly um, were recruited, if you will, by True Footage as a startup. They were looking for some of the best businesses as well as the best people um, to lead this prop tech startup uh, and kind of propagate it throughout throughout the country. Um, and so it was through my coaching students that um, as they were being acquired, said to the CEO, you, you got to talk with Blaine because I think he'd be a real asset in the organization. So that's how I came to the true footage. I love it. What a great way, like referred by others. I mean, I can only imagine how that initial conversation went. Like obviously your reputation preceded you uh, in terms of what your engagement was going to look like. Um, I mean, head of community, chief evangelist. Um, what did, I think you said CEO. So like, what did, what did the CEO how did you, how did you land at it? I mean, I, I can, I can see this going a couple different ways. I can see um, a CEO saying, gosh, I've heard great things about this Blaine guy. I need to figure out how to plug him into what we're doing. And then you, it's an open discussion. I can also imagine, um, you know, starting a business in the 2020s, there are some things that you would do naturally because it's part of, you know, the right way to do things or the, what we think of as the right way to do things that you wouldn't have done maybe starting something in the 2010s or the, or the yeah. 2000s. Um, and, and so saying, gosh, there are a couple of roles I, I think I want to fill and maybe uh, Blaine is best at this. Like, how did that whole thing go? Like, how did you approach it? How did uh, how did he or she approach it? Yeah, great question. Um, we, we approached it like like deer in, in headlights. Um, he didn't necessarily know what was there. I didn't necessarily know what was there. Uh, I was speaking at a conference, a multi-day conference in Vegas, appraiser conference. Um, we, we met up in the hallway of the Bellagio hotel. We sat outside a cafe for four hours, just talking about wow. vision. Yeah. Uh, and, and I was testing him as much as he was testing me. And about once every hour, he would slam his hand on the table and say, so you're in. And I would say, no, I'm not even close to being in. And we would continue the conversation. <laughs> Then the next hour, he goes, great. Sounds like you're in. And I would say, nope, not even close. Uh, so we left that conversation maybe a little closer, but no closer to, to deciding how I might fit in. 
uh, because I wasn't sure about the, the mission and the vision. And I wanted to make sure if I was going to be part of it, we were mission driven. Um, and I'm happy to say a year of, of being into this, that the CEO has lived up to everything he's promised, a very fair individual, a tremendous visionary, and he loved it. Uh, I, I like talking mission and vision. And again, this goes back to this belief thing. If I can't believe in what we're doing, uh, I, I don't think I will be good for the position. Uh, the titles came around, came, came, came about somewhat um, interestingly. The title of head of community was given to me, and I think it was more of an HR decision for payroll. Like, what category do we fit him in for the IRS? Uh, head of community sounds good. I've never been the head of community at an organization before, although I've built several large communities, just inadvertently. Uh, the chief evangelist role, a title, excuse me, I stole. I just flat out started calling myself the chief evangelist. Um, and I kind of sold it that, listen, we need a chief evangelist. And I did through our small leadership team as we would have some offsites at the beginning, developing core values and our mission. Uh, I, would, I was planting the word evangelize all the time. We need to evangelize around this. And uh, I found myself leading many of those discussions. And then I knew it was working when the others at the table would say, Blaine is the best one to evangelize this. And he, he's our chief evangelist. Um, and then I just kept inserting the title. You know, So I feel like I've got an internal title of head of community and then an external uh, title, an outward facing title. So I do all the, the conferences and the talks and the speaking and the blogging and the podcasting and, and all of that stuff and kind of evangelizing around the, the mission. Cool. Uh, you just ripped through a bunch of kind of activity areas, which is something, you know, that I think we both agreed and you said right off the top is like, it was all kinds of different stuff. Um, yeah. Give us just a quick snapshot of that. I, you just ripped a few of them off, break those down a little bit. Like what are some of the, like on a, you know, in a good week or a good month or a good quarter, what are a handful of the at main activity areas that you're um, engaged in? Yeah. Uh, so I, I will say, I will admit because I am something of a neophyte at this and I, I, I lean on you for, um, for growth in this area and I'm still evolving. We'll have a completely different discussion 10 years from now. Uh, I know one of the, the, the rules from, from Guy Kawasaki and, and other people you've interviewed, I've studied them in depth. And one of the rules is be uh, kind of disengaged from ops, from the operations. Um, unfortunately, being one of the kind of founding seven, developing the core values and the mission, I am still part of the ops team. Um, so I'm, I'm involved daily in, in meetings and ops decisions, although not too technical. I'm not developing code. I'm not uh, building policy or anything like that, but, but definitely involved in, in um, ops meetings. Uh, and then I am in all of these other areas that might be more tied to the chief evangelist role. So we're involved in branding and marketing and van, uh, involved in um, building a conference we, we plan to hold next year for uh, not only our competitors, but, but all kind of the stakeholders in the industry. Uh, podcasting, we created a podcast called Playing Big. Um, like you, I, I try to be an influencer or a presence, um, adding value on LinkedIn and just kind of getting uh, our, our mission and vision without evangelizing the product. Uh, more evangelizing the problem and um, just just being kind of the face. Yeah, so I, similar, by the way, I'm in all of the, so I, I came up in marketing and was VP marketing before the shift, which was, unlike you, it was not something I, I thought a lot about. It was something that was proposed to me. Yeah. Um, and uh, in any case, I, I'm in all the marketing leadership meetings. I'm in all the senior leadership and executive leadership team meetings. I'm still in, like, I'm not playing by that original 10 things I learned from the four uh, chief evangelists. I, I'm still, and, and I would also say that's probably seasonal. I think as you, as you go forward over the next two, three years in the context of what you're doing, you'll find that there are periods where some things are more true and less true. Um, and, and then it moves a little bit. Um, talk about uh, belief. Like So, so first of all, I, I love that you were involved in, um, influencing and then now evangelizing the mission and the values, kind of the 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 how we do this, not just the what we do, but speak to the what we do. Like, what is the innovation? Uh, because again, tying back to that original uh, thing that you, you and I were both kind of learning around the same time, I, as I was doing it, you, you as I published it, um, that innovation demands evangelism, right? It's this idea of, hey, uh, good news, this problem that we've all been solving in this kind of ineffective way, uh, there's a new way to do it or good news. You maybe didn't even recognize you had this problem, but 
um, you do have this problem and there's a solution to it. I mean, this is kind of the essence of the, the evangelistic uh, um, message. Um, what is the innovation uh, or what is the approach that True Footage is taking to appraisal that demands uh, this, this function? Yeah, great question. You said a mouthful, um, and and some of the the references weren't lost on me. The uh, bringing the good news, you know, that is evangelism essentially, um, as well as kind of the internal components and and the external components. Um, first distinction that uh, I brought and am still kind of evangelizing around at True Footage internally is that we are an appraiser company, not an appraisal company, mm. uh, and I think that's an important distinction because we have yeah we have. Uh, a, a multitude of clients. You know, we have the investors. Uh, you know, the, the the equity side over here, but we have um, all of our external uh, clients and customers, the lenders and and whatnot. Um, and then we have, as you know, the the EX, the employee experience. We have all of our internal um, clients and customers, and um, it's important for them to know that we are not just a product producing. We're not just a producing appraisals. We are an appraiser company, which means we have to focus on that that internal employee experience as much or more. And I learned from you um, that that your customer service will only be as good as, can never exceed essentially your, your uh, employee experience. And so we're working on that all the time. Uh, and the problem we're solving there really at its core is um, there's a massive lack of, of community in the appraiser world. I was going to say the appraiser community, but um, there's there's really no appraiser community. There's some big Facebook groups and things like that, um, but you know the the guy just effect and how there's really no uh, consequences for bad behavior via keyboards, and they can be really just kind of cesspools of negativity. So we realized, uh, and and you you alluded to it that sometimes people don't know what they want or need until they have it, and so we we've realized now as we've grown well over 200 appraisers now, largest appraiser company in the country, that. Uh, appraisers, as much as if you were to ask them, hey, would you appreciate having a very, you know, uplifting community of your peers to to lean on? Many would say no, kind of like Ford asking people what they want and they would say faster horses because uh, they didn't know they needed or wanted a car until they had it. And so it, it, building that community, all of a sudden I'm having people come out in, in meetings and masterminds saying, I love the community, which is a, a way of saying, I love the culture. I love what we're doing here. Everybody's uplifting. Nobody's talking down to me. Nobody's condescending. Um, and that is super powerful as we now move outside because what we transmit outside to our external clients feels a certain way. It smells, it tastes, and it sounds different when you love what you're doing and you are surrounded by brothers and sisters who lift you up and hold you accountable, but you're growing and evolving as a result. And that's one of the best things after a year of kind of pushing this idea. Uh, one of the, the greatest satisfactions for me is hearing people say, I just love being part of this. I didn't even know I wanted it or that I needed it. Uh, on the external side of things, the problem that essentially we're solving as an, solving as an appraiser company is there is a massive inefficiency problem in the appraisal world. Um, the, 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 the vast majority of appraisers are one man or one woman shops, we call them, you know, one person, a sole proprietor, um, great people, great appraisers, um, but they can only do as much as they can do as one human being. And although there's some great tech tools out there, we're in fact building um, two of the, the greatest efficiency tools that could be promoted in the, in the appraisal world. But uh, you can only do as much as you can do as a human in a 8, 10, 12, 16 hour day, which many of them work when it's busy. Um, but you are always capped. And so leverage is a big deal. Um, and we realized that there were great appraisers out there, but they were so kind of capped from an efficiency standpoint that they couldn't focus on the things that really made them great, appraising real estate. They were doing all these other things and wearing all these hats that the sole proprietor often wears. Um, so we as a company have developed kind of that back office um, as well as the front office. So, you know, scheduling and branding and marketing and um, just a whole suite of things. We bring people into this really uplifting community, uh, an awesome culture, and then we give them all the tools and try to take off of their shoulder all of the inefficiencies so they can just focus on what they do best. And they have found now in doing this, again, it's one of those things where they go, 
didn't even know I needed this. Didn't realize how inefficient I was. Uh, just thought this is the way it works. And then they, they realize they come into this thing and they realize, wow, this is what I've been looking for without even knowing it. Yeah. It's funny. It reminds me of a line from, um, a movie called fools rush in, uh, with Selma Hayek. And, uh, I forget his name. One of the friends, uh, yeah. yeah you're everything I never knew I always wanted. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And and I like that you went to both kind of, I'm going to kind of simplify it to like the head and the heart side of it. It's like, I didn't know I needed um, all of this practical stuff and these practical ways of working in this tool set. Um, and I also didn't realize how much I could, you know, learn, grow, feel supported by all of the people around me. Uh, I So risk of asking the obvious, these appraisers, these hundreds of appraisers mm -hmm. uh, are distributed all over the country. Right. Um, what does community look like for them? Are we talking Slack channels? Are we talking like other internal communication platforms? You mentioned a conference. Is that just for all these appraisers or is it for the, uh, you meant, but you also mentioned competitors in that, like, um, talk about the, the various, to the degree that there are, um, maybe layers of community. What are the dip? So what are some of the different ways that community, uh, looks in this context? Yeah, great question, because it is the challenge. Uh, we are fully distributed, which is a funny way of just saying we're spread out all over the U.S., well, really all over the world, um, our development team and whatnot. Um, we also have appraisers that, because of the way we have our functions set up, uh, appraisers can be remote, um, and they can live in different areas that they appraise in as long as they have geographic competency in that that area. You know, you grow up in Denver, but you want to move to Zihuatanejo and, um, you know, do the analysis side of appraisals. You can do that in our company. Um, so bringing community together is a big challenge when you're not all in the same office. Uh, I know that from running a big dojo. I know that from running an organization where we had offices and we had company meetings and you could high five and feel a human hand on the other end. Uh, it's difficult. So yes, Slack is a big component. Um, what we What we have found, and I found myself using a lot of your language, Ethan, is uh, Slack was awesome at the beginning. Slack has become very polluted, um, you know, in a good way, but it's so noisy when you go from, you know, 10 people to 500 people in a year and uh, the, the Slack channels, you know, I was responsible for creating some of the first Slack channels, the, you are awesome channel and the, um, ski and snowboard bums channel. And, you know, and then our, all of our ops channels, well, all of a sudden now there's 60 or 70 different channels for different functions. Um, the general channel is might as well be one of the biggest Facebook groups in the country where you post anything in the general channel, it just gets swallowed by the next post and the next post and the next post. And then you'll be in a meeting and say, well, didn't you guys see my post in the general Slack channel? No, it's covered by 12 other posts. So um, Slack, we, we do use, I, I find the small group function uh, a little more viable now that we're so big. So you tend to create small groups for, for operations or for things you're working on or projects. Um, and you lock those groups down. So it's just those five or 10 people talking. Um, we do have Google Meet and Zoom meetings every single week. So we're communicating this way. Uh, we do some fun stuff on Slack and we're we're kind of adding more of that, some virtual coffee chats and um, we're adding happy hours uh, and things like that. We're working with a company now to add some um, virtual murder mysteries and you know to try to bring people together and have some fun. And then we do add the the physical component where we are are doing. We had several kind of tests over this last year of doing regional meetups. Um, so I was just in Chicago several weeks ago. We got the whole region together. We played top golf, and and kind of got to break bread together and meet each other in person. Um, and we've done that in Houston and you know, Seattle and kind of all around. And that too is one of the things that people come back from and go, had no idea how valuable that was to me. I see you all on, on Zoom. We're talking on Slack. We feel like we know each other. But to be able to wrap your arms around somebody and give them a hug and and talk to them face-to-face, -face, it's three-dimensional. It's four-dimensional. And uh, that, that's been tremendous. So we're, we're looking in 2023 to do much, much more of that. Love it. And in the other thing, I really appreciated where you ended there in the, the idea that um... – I'm extending it to say that the next time you get on Zoom, it's not the same anymore, right? right? The person looks different. The person feels different. Like, I know, like, there's something in that word. Like, I know, I know that person. I know that person in a way that I didn't know them, you know, in the 
you know, nine months that I spent on Zoom calls with them before. Um, and it does make a huge, huge difference. And I like that that you're committed to bring it to life. Talk about the conference idea. And I know I know that it's still like in development, but you mentioned it before. Um, this is bigger than that. It is bigger than that. And I and I have to give some credit. Um, although the conference idea has been on my mind for years. Um, one just based purely in ego, everything I go into, I always think I can do better. So like you, we've been to many conferences and, and whatnot. Um, and I get there and I'm in many cases bored to death by the speakers. I think they put people up there that maybe aren't the great greatest in those positions, but maybe especially they have... if it's all paid speakers, that's, you, oh, yeah. that becomes immediately trans uh, it's by paid. I mean, sponsors yeah. get to speak and you're like this person probably, yeah, this is not the right person. And appraiser conferences are filled with that because it's lenders, it's AMCs, the appraisal management companies, it's title company, it's whatever. And they're all up there for a reason, which is to kind of push their product. Um, yeah, it's just, it's mind numbingly boring. Um, there was no, and, and uh, appraiser conferences specifically, they're not like realtor conferences where you, you might have some breakouts to grow your business and talk about marketing or scripts or whatever. Um, it's usually all around appraising. It's the, the technical and the tactical, which again, can be mind numbingly boring. And although you leave and maybe you're a better appraiser, you're no better of a business person. You're no better of a human being. You're just better technically or tactically. Um, and I always left those things wanting and going, why aren't they talking about, I mean, the biggest problems in the industry are these efficiency problems. They're um, appraisers not knowing how to handle their money. They're not building wealth. They're not developing uh, survival accounts. They're not, they don't know about branding and, you know, the list was long. And so this had been growing in my mind, like I'm going to put on a conference where it's, it's going to be none of the stuff they've gotten in past conferences and everything they've not gotten. Um, and then a little credit to to, to Sangram Bajre. Uh, he he, I, I screenshot a screenshot a post from him um, on his Substack. He does a blog uh, where he kind of walks people through, you know, his his startup journey. Um, he's done that several times, but this one he'd kind of uh, open up the the kimono, so to speak, and show people what it's like day day in the life of. Um, and one of his posts, he's talking about the conference that he developed. You you know the the title of it. Um, where he invited competitors to speak. Um, and I had kind of been selling this idea to our CEO for a while, and I, I don't think he quite got it, which is more a statement on me. I haven't done a good job of evangelizing around it. But I think there is something very powerful around um, saying, look, we're all in this together. Uh, we'd like to hear your voice. And, and quite simply, when you invite your competitors to come to your conference, you are the authority. You are looked at as the one. Um, and, you know, of course you might lose some business or some appraisers might choose, oh, I really like this one. They were going to go anyway. Uh, I learned this running my, my Aikido school. People would come in and say, why should we choose your school? And I would always say, I don't know if you should. That, that, you have to decide that. Uh, because I can't keep you here if you don't want to be here. You have to decide, do you like the atmosphere and the teaching and the style and these things? But go look at everybody else. And if somebody didn't come back and sign up, I realized, perfect, it, everything is working perfectly. They weren't meant to be here. And so um, th that's kind of the conference idea is help appraisers be better business people. Uh, of course, it, it you know, if, if somebody likes what we're doing and, 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 and hears something they really want to be a part of, well, of course, recruiting becomes a natural follow through and, and a bridge for them. Uh, but it, we won't be actively recruiting. We just want to make, we want to lift up the whole industry. And we just know that that will have natural beneficial consequences. I love the vision of that. It, it, um, and by the way, when you get in the weeds on it, hit me up. I mean, we, we only, we've only done one conference at bomb bomb, but it was, um, it was fantastic. All of the speakers were, uh, volunteers from our community. A couple of them we, we bought airfare for, I think we put them all up in our hotel block, but mm -hmm. you know, we weren't throwing out money, not, no sponsorships whatsoever. Uh, and yet we were still able to, we were on the, a little bit in the, on the black side of break even. Um, so that was perfect. Yeah. And Amazing. it was this, it, it was, now we didn't go to the extent of inviting competitors because I hadn't been introduced to that idea yet. What an interesting thing. And I really like the spirit of it. It's this idea of, are we doing this or not? Like if you don't invite everybody, then it's not a community event. It's not an industry right. event. It's a user conference or a customer conference or something like that. So I really appreciate the approach. Uh, I assume 
that with evangelism tied to your title, uh, that you may have been asked about it. What are, what are some of the questions you've gotten about the title and, and maybe what advice have you given people that were asking in like less in a, just a general curiosity zone, but more in a, uh, in a business context, like, do we need an evangelist who needs an evangelist, et cetera? Like what kinds of conversations have you had there? And maybe what kind of advice do you have for people that are listening to this episode of this podcast, wondering, you know, do we need this? What, you know, who, who needs this? How do we do it? Like any thoughts you have on your own experience? Yeah. Um, well, you know, aside from the comical ones, which I've heard some other speakers talk about the religious connotations, I have one longtime friend. He's one of the best lenders I know, built an awesome company here in town. Um, always kind of jokes when we see each other that I, he thinks I should be wearing a big robe, like a religious robe. And he introduces me as the chief evangelist, you know, uh, but in that kind of religious connotation. Um, and, and we joke about it. But aside from that, you know, again, going back to the belief thing um, and realizing that I had been evangelizing for 20 plus years, just never calling it that. It's when you believe in something. Now, one of the beliefs I have, too, uh, about being a good evangelist is developing your own teachable point of view. I learned this from my Aikido instructor is you, you might have opinions, but you also have to have a teachable point of view. Develop a point of view on something and then develop teaching points and components around it so you're elevating, you're lifting people up. You're not just offering your opinion. Um, and with that, and then tens of thousands of at-bats with Aikido students and those kinds of things, um, you, you learn that that teachable point of view thing is really, really important, and it helps differentiate you from others. It's not about just being the best at something. In many cases, it's about being different because different is what gets eyeballs and attention, which uh, attention, you know, a tied to time, time is our most valuable currency and asset. And attention is a tight component of that. And if you can get people tilting their heads because they hear and see something different, now you've got something. You don't have the ability to influence if they're turned off, they're, they're, they're not listening. Um, especially when people are just expounding on how good they are. Um, I don't believe it's about being good, uh, which is to, to speak to the conference component and inviting your competitors. It's not about being the best. It's about being different. And you are definitely showing you're different. You're getting heads to tilt when you go, we have no fear. In fact, they're not competitors. Uh, we could be doing joint partnerships. We could be uh, lifting each other up. We could be growing. Uh, there could be people in those organizations at the C level that want to join our company after they see what we're doing. You know, who knows what it's going to be, but it's this kind of holistic view. But my belief about evangelism is there are evangelists walking amongst every company. They are. They just don't maybe have the title. I mean, in every sales department, of course, people are evangelizing. Uh, they're evangelizing around the product and maybe doing it really, really well. Um, they're hopefully evangelizing around the problem, you know, learning from you and Guy Kawasaki and Sangram and, and all those um, great people, you know, teaching on this topic. But it's just whether or not um, a, an organization needs a chief individual who does this. But I think there is a, an anointing period or point um, whereby if an organization recognizes somebody special, and I'm not saying I'm special, but somebody like you um, or Sangerman, I know some of the chief evangelists in those other organizations anointed themselves, but they just realized that they were the best person for the job and they were doing it in a way or had a vision that others didn't see. Uh, but I think when we look at the qualities that are, I think, really important for, for an evangelist, a good evangelist, and then a chief evangelist, um, again, it's having that very deep, strong belief about the vision and the mission. Uh, of course, deep knowledge about uh, what it is you do and, and, and the problems you're solving. Um, but then an ability to communicate and articulate that in a way that is different than what they've heard. And not everybody can do that. Some people are just following the script. They're evangelizing around the product. And so I think uh, for, for somebody at a C level to decide, gosh, are we ready for a chief evangelist? You really have to look at somebody and say, um, are they an Ethan Butte? Are they somebody who can articulate in such a unique uh, and different fashion than probably anybody else? And you've got a teachable point of view. You're inspiring others. I mean, I am a bomb bomb fanatic, thanks to you. Uh, I use it 30, 40, 50 times a day. And it's changed the way we do business. And it's because of the way you've been able to articulate and communicate your belief around the problems that it's solving. So I think that's, you know, there are evangelists, it's whether or not they get anointed to an actual title um, and, and whether or not that's useful for an organization. 
so much good stuff in there. And first, uh, I should have said this earlier. Thank you so much for your very generous uh, language for uh, our relationship and and the work that I do. It's a joy to do. I think I the way that you described, I understand how you identify with it because I am a hundred percent in belief of the things that I do. And that's my primary motivation. I probably left a lot of money on the table over the years as a consequence, but like that belief piece matters. I also love the, the no fear language that you use. Like we have no fear. I'm so confident in who we are, what we're about, what we're doing, the value we're bringing, the people we're lifting up, the people that are coming behind them, because they also believe the same way the frontline believes that we don't have any fear and that the right thing's going to happen just to even tying back to your, to your, um, to your dojo reference, like the right thing is going to happen here. And if we can, if we can, and I think this also builds the bridge to why you might look to appoint an evangelist, which is um, it's not quite clear how we are different. And it's, we need to help people answer that question of whether or not we belong. Do I belong here in this community? Do I belong here as a subscriber of this service or a buyer of this product? Do I belong here? I think the idea of putting an evangelist who truly believes and can express and articulate that helps people understand in a different way. Um, and I also appreciate that we brought in uh, time, uh, time and attention there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so much good stuff here. It is so, I find myself getting ahead of myself. I'm always thinking about like, okay, what's the theme of this episode? How am I going to title it? I'm like, it's so far ahead. It's stupid. I should be much more present in this moment. Um, so I'll go to uh future of evangelism. Like I, you've already spoken a little bit to it and you did a really nice job talking about how a leader might think about whether, who is the person in your organization that you might tap for this and whether or not you should tap someone for this or appoint someone in general, specific to the role in the title, any thoughts on the future of it? Will we see more? Will we see less? Will it morph? Will it disappear? I've had, I've heard all of those responses uh, in this zone. Like, do you have any thoughts on the future of this as a thing? Yeah, no, great question. And I've listened to some of the other answers too, which have, have informed my own beliefs on it. Uh, because I'm so new to it, uh, it's hard to have a long vision about where it might go. Uh, I, I literally, I, I don't have it down here. I was going to bring it down here, but I literally saw the title on your business card when I ordered a, a, a box of books, you know, the, the books that you had written, I wanted to give to all, all my coaching students. Um, and your card was in there. And I thought, that's interesting. And that's how I learned really of the title. And then I started seeing it in Guy Kawasaki and those kinds of things. But when I saw, when I, when I saw the title and realized, oh, makes perfect sense for who Ethan is as well as what he does and how he does it. Um, I wanted, I, I realized that for me that, oh, I, I do that myself. Uh, so as, I think we, and we need to separate the title from the function again and the job. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whether or not the title persists, uh, I, I personally think it will. We know it's primarily prevalent in the tech side of things, startups, tech startups, that kind of thing. Um, there, of course, can be some resistance where people hear evangelists, they automatically assume you are evangelizing the product. Oh, he's selling. Of course, he's the evangelist. And so we find ourselves explaining instead of just evangelizing the problem, not the product, we have to first set the stage and say, I'm not going to evangelize my product. I've, I've got nothing to sell here. Um, so I think that can be a little bit of a, a, a an extra step. That may not be required with the title. There, there are times where I realized, oh, I wish nobody knew that that was my title. I wouldn't have to explain that I'm not selling anything here. I want you to be a better, because it's like, even then they're always waiting for, what's the hook? Where's he going to sell me on something? Uh, so I, I would see that as kind of the friction of whether or not the title persists, um, whether or not it 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 does or, or it evolves into some, I, th- I think I heard, um, uh, Randy, maybe somebody talking about chief storyteller or, you know, these other variations of it, which I think are all great. Um, but for now we have it, you're, you're helping shape, um, language around it and, uh, some awareness around it. Uh, and, and I absolutely love it. Cool. I, um, I, that is what motivated, like, I'm just doing all the, like, we're interviewing this, or I, you know, we started this call at 6.30 in the morning, my time, like, 
I believe in this. I do want to normalize it. I want to explore it. I'm not necessarily, uh, I don't have a strong position on title versus function, but I am strongly of the belief that, uh, that this type of role is useful inside a lot of different organizations, even if it's only the internal focus kind of, um, I feel like that's a strong part of what you're doing is like when I hear community, typically it's, you know, how do I bring a bunch of people together so that maybe at some point down the line, they feel compelled to buy our product or service. And I feel like so much of your community is just making these hundreds of people that have committed to, to doing things the true footage way that they feel welcome and supported and that they know each other and all of this. So like, there's so, I believe very strongly that this is a key point of the future of success in business in general. Uh, and it can look a lot of different ways. It can be titled a lot of different ways, but I really appreciate what you're doing and, and for you sharing all that with us. Let's set, um, let's set uh, martial arts on the side for this one. Fun mm -hmm. one. What's something that you find yourself evangelizing in your own personal life, or perhaps that somebody has even accused you of evangelizing in your own personal life? Yeah, uh, again, uh, all great questions, very thoughtful, uh, and I appreciate it. Um, I thought about this one as I was listening through some of the others, um, and, and I have to say, and this is going to sound so cheesy, but hopefully ties into everything we've talked about, uh, what I evangelize on a day-to-day -day basis is the growth and evolution of human beings. Uh, I don't care about products. I don't care about things. Uh, like you said, you've left money on the table. I've We've all left money on the table because a lot of those things just don't matter to us. What matters to us is the mission. And, you know, I get up every single morning for three hours. I just write content and thoughts and ideas and things like that. Um, and they're always around coaching others, helping others, and trying to uh, leave the world a better place than than we found it, so to speak. Um, and again, not to sound cheesy, but I find myself really driven uh, and I've recognized a very selfish need in me that I get tremendous self-satisfaction from helping others grow and develop. Uh, I, I more or less sacrificed a, a marriage over it. You know, people call us workaholics and things like that. Um, but I, I just realized uh, I, that's how I'm driven. And if I'm not doing that, I'm not being the person that I know I am meant to be. Um, and so I, I think that's what I evangelize around all the time. Man, there's a whole nother conversation around uh, that morning routine. I love the commitment and um, and I appreciate the spirit of what you're doing and your self-awareness about it and um, and even your awareness that you've made sacrifices to do it. But I think it's it's in that, this is cheesy too, <laughs> like a win-win zone. Like it's perfectly acceptable for you to pursue it because it's good for you because it's good for everybody else too. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So throughout, for folks listening throughout this conversation, Blaine has mentioned uh, some of the other folks. Uh, Randy uh, Frisch was episode one. Jen Allen was episode two. Jim Callback was episode three. Sangram Vajray was episode four. Uh, Guy Kawasaki, episode six. Um, we're having these conversations every single week, or at least as to the degree my schedule can support that. Uh, and Blaine, I really appreciate you joining us for this one. And for people who've stuck with us here to the very end, uh, where would you send people? Because I assume they might want to connect with you or learn more about True Footage and and get more of your perspective. Yeah. So uh, if they if they want to um, learn more about True Footage, it's quite simply truefootage.tech. Make sure it's not .com. We are a prop tech company, so it's truefootage.tech. Um, and you can kind of learn all about us there. People can always reach out to me at, at it's blaine.fyan at truefootage.tech or uh, my coaching website, coachblaine.com. Um, and kind of learn more about that or get in touch with me there. Super. Uh, I link all that stuff up. So in your podcast app, it is going to be right there. If you scroll down and look at the episode description, we also put stuff up at chiefevangelist.com. We're doing the entire interviews as well as highlights at youtube.com slash at chief evangelist. They started this new hashtag thing. I feel really good about that because uh, it's easy to reference, but it is weird. You have to go youtube.com slash at chief evangelist. Uh, and you can see all that stuff. Blaine, thank you so much. I enjoyed this as always. We covered a lot of ground and I got, I, I learned a lot about you that I did not already know. And to me, that is a joy. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you spending this time with me. I appreciate you. Pleasure's been all mine. That wraps up this episode of Chief Evangelist. Thank you for joining us. And thanks to Ringmaster Conversational Marketing for helping bring these episodes to you. With any thoughts or questions about the Chief Evangelist role, message me on LinkedIn. I'm Ethan Butte, E-T-H-A-N-B-E-U-T-E. -E. 
For show notes and more of these conversations, visit chiefevangelist.com.